This predictable scaling effect of transformers is actually one of the main reasons right now why I have so much faith in our ability to continue delivering amazing results in AI. If you were to explain to your mom or dad what Adept does, how do you explain it to them? Yeah, so um, the simplest way of thinking about Adept is we are building a natural language interface to your computer. We're basically training uh, a new type of giant model that turns um, natural language into actions on your machine. So um, in the same way that you might um, you might have seen you know uh, models like the GPTs and ChatGPT or Palm be able to turn uh, natural language description of like hey like write me a news article about X and I'll just generate you all the text that's a text to text model or like Dolly and Stable Diffusion and all that that turn um, natural language into the pixels of an image like give me an avocado chair and we'll just generate you that photo. Um, we're basically just training a, a model where we're collecting lots of data of how people use computers such that we can then, paired with a natural language description of what they did. And now what you end up with is you end up with a general taskless model where um, just through language, you can you can get your machine basically to do anything that you can put into words. So real process automation. I kind of think about it as like way more general than process automation because it's it's just a brand new way of using your machine. But if uh, comparing it to process automation, you can kind of think about it as like if RPA is painting the yellow line on the floor and having the robot follow it, like what we're doing is much more like full self-driving. Yeah, totally. And so the AI has gone through like winter, spring, summer, and so on. And right now we are like in full bloom summer. Help our viewers understand like what has changed? Like why, why in the last 10 years have things been so fertile in AI? And you know, where we are at today, where like chat GPT is in the lexicon of everyone from eight to 80 years old. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, it's so interesting to watch this particular cycle. One of the most interesting dynamics that has happened is like sort of these like these like singular events that seem like it was just a straight discontinuity in the trajectory of AI that have actually had fairly predictable progress the whole time. I think one really interesting thing is deep learning. People have been working on deep learning for a really long time, but I feel like it really broke out when it got sufficiently good on ImageNet, right? Back in 2012, where people really started to pay attention and all the naysayers around deep learning had to had to change their change their tune, right? Yeah. Um, I think like that was that was transformational. I think transformers were were transformational because like on top of what many people talk about with Transformers, the thing that really stands out about them to me is the fact that they have uh, two properties. One is that they map really well to compute. So um, like that nice co-evolution of training hardware and the architecture mm. lets us just throw ridiculous amounts of compute power at things. And I think the other one is just that Transformers like predictably scale. You make one of these models, um, let's say 2x larger, commensurately better on data and commensurately better on, on, on compute. And you get a predictable like linear performance gain on tasks that you care about. And it doesn't seem to stop from very small models all the way to very large ones. Um, and I think that that just gives people confidence to really invest, right? And see these models do smarter things. The last piece of this as well is just the rise of like foundation models or large models in general. We've seen them for language, we've seen them for images, we're seeing them for video. There's what we're working on, there's a couple other ones. Mm -hmm. um, but what's just so powerful about them is that for the first time you kind of have this like taskless model, yeah. right? Like in the past it was like, you wanna go solve problem X, like is it a cat or a dog, right? You, mm -hmm. trained, a, you trained a model on cat and dog data and you collected a lot of it and you, and you, and you hope for the best, right? right. But now, Everyone. And that was the original ImageNet. Exactly. Yeah, and that was like n-way classification, right? Yeah. Um, but here we now have a model where you 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 kind of train it in an, in a self-supervised way um, to uh, just generally understand the whole space of what's possible, and then you just prime it with language to do the thing that you want it to do, and um, and this like thing just breaks everything because you have. You have a, you have a you have a general tool for which making new tools is actually better to train the general tool thing first than it is to build a specific right. thing. So that actually sparks a very interesting thought at uh, LinkedIn, which now has like over a billion uh, you know users. When we first the company started in two thousand and three, so it's twenty years this year. Actually, it's a big celebrate celebratory year for the company. Uh, we used to think in terms of value loops, and you know. Any enduring company and a company lasting 20 years in the tech field is definitely very enduring, has multiple value loops and they can take 
longer durations or different durations to build. So the very first value loop that LinkedIn created was between its member and opportunity in form of jobs and business connections. Mm -hmm. The second value loop that took a little longer as the membership grew was connectivity within the ecosystem and a net professional network. Mm -hmm. And the third value loop, which is just beginning to emerge and grow stronger is the member and learning and upskilling of what they need to do. What you're talking about is also various value loops within the organization. Like how do you think about it and what do you think is the immediate one and what are the new value loops that will come uh, through ADAPT? Yeah, I think thinking about the different ways in which things compound is fascinating. And yeah. I think in this era of AI, it's actually much more than just compute. I know a lot of the narrative has been dominated by compute so far. But, you know, zooming out, like what Adept is building is we're, we're basically building a natural language interface to your computer, right? Anything that a human should be able to put into words, your computer should be able to do it for you through Adept, right? And so when we think about the different phases, I think about it as really three different stages of the company. I think in the very first stage, we're really focused on this um, pure interface question, right? Which is, um, which is you as a user, let's say you want to go like create a financial model or take, um, take these 16 leads on LinkedIn and put them into Salesforce or something like that. Like you have these goals, um, how well as, as can our model deliver that for you? I think a giant part of this is related to, to, um, to human feedback, right? Like we want our users to be able to teach the model how to do new things every day. We want our users to be able to tell the model when it's doing well and not well. And I think that just quickly leads to gains in model performance. Mm -hmm. But I actually think like as you start nailing this interface question, um, what adept becomes changes a lot. It stops being just a thing that you ask for simple tasks for. Mm -hmm. It really starts becoming and starts feeling more and more like an actual teammate and collaborator, right? Like um, adept should become like basically like like a really really competent um, um, like UI designer that you could team up mm -hmm. with, right? It should be a really really competent uh, person for helping you figure out things on your financials, right? Like as the model learns how to do the basic tasks, it starts composing them into the bigger picture ones. And I think this just is a qualitatively different experience as these models get smarter in terms of the abstraction level. So I think um, so I think that's like another zone. And I would say like the very long term thing that we're extremely excited about is basically like um, when you have uh, a model that's at level of smart that you can interact with, what ultimately ends up happening to software and computing, right? I think in the next five years, like most people are going to go interface with their computers through something high level like natural language. Yeah, it's gonna um, in, in the same way that like during the like the Windows three point one sort of transition, right? You booted your machine up into the command line, you typed Windows, and you had the GUI, and you mostly did things in the GUI, and you dropped in the command line if you couldn't do it in the GUI. Yeah. I think in the in like this five year period, people are just going to put their intent into words, and the machine will do it for you. And, and you'll drop into the GUI uh, only when you really need to do something in that in that area. Um, and so then I think the way that software is going to be designed is going to be completely different as well, right? Like, will you really need menus? Will you really need to go think about like these long tail ways of accessing certain capabilities when you sort of have this like universal teammate? I think those are like very different like like stages of growth, kind of like where you were saying with, yeah. with LinkedIn. Yeah. Well, I can't wait for that future to happen and also the fact that hopefully it will reduce the incident of uh, carpal tunnel syndrome in many of us <laughs> who've been pointing and clicking and typing like yes. all our lives. Yes. Uh, how do you think about starting companies? Talk to us a little bit about the first company you had and then what drove you to build Adapt and you know work on the problem statement that you're working on. Yeah, I think um, one common thing throughout is just that um, it's just that I really think that we want to be building uh, useful AI systems. So um, for a while, um, I was responsible for research and engineering at OpenAI, where I was the VPN from 2017 to mid 2020. And then I went to go lead the large models effort at Google Brain um, for, for, for another year after that. But during this whole period, I mean, um, I was I always came at it from the mindset of AI is really going to be the thing. It's like going to be able to train these systems that have like emergent behavior if you give it data like that just was so cool. And I always thought about how exciting it would be if we could actually just put this in everybody's hands uh, in, in, a, in a very responsible way. But like to get there, we were bottlenecked on research for so long. Um, just nothing worked. I started out doing robotics. Like I was like, you know, let's make robots do smart things. And I was like, they can't perceive. So I worked in perception. And after working in perception for a while, I moved over to language. It was just like whatever the like research problem was that needed to be solved, I really wanted to go work on that. Somewhere around, you know, like two major milestones. First, the invention of the transformer at Google, which we scaled up at OpenAI to turn into um, to turn into the GPTs and and all that. Um, and also like um, just the rise of like large models in general, whether for language or otherwise. It just became clear that like now this was the time where you could actually build something that people would use every day. 
um, that was a major part of uh, of what inspired us to get started with building Adept to begin with. And I think that um, at, at every given moment in time, I want to be solving problems that get us closer and closer to like sort of this like universal general teammate for people. And so um, in both times, I really try to try to swing at that particular problem. And I think what's common about it is sort of this framework about think, thinking about where value will accrue in AI. I think that um, at this moment in time, as uh, models continue to get smarter and more capable, I think the thing that um, is ultimately the most valuable is when you can use AI not as a way to build a new feature in an existing product, which I think there will be um, there will be many opportunities for incumbents to go to go do that. Right, like if if the thing you're working on can sort of um, be framed as a call to to an LM to go drop some data in an existing tool. I think that incumbents will actually pick a lot of that low hanging fruit. Hmm. I think the most interesting opportunities in AI, um, both then and now, actually, are ones where you um, where you have an opportunity to like think think about ways in which uh, different software tools could be bundled or unbundled hmm. with AI as the ultimate workflow engine. And um, and I think that like brand new interfaces to computing um, that are like could only be possible with current AI technologies are probably where it's at. Yeah. So it's really, you know, the model revolution that started with deep learning uh, coupled with the right kind of compute that can, and the model plus compute equation is scaling horizontally in a big way, but also the fundamental way in which these models work where they become better by themselves without humans have to interrupt and interject too much. In that latter part, there's obviously a lot of worry in the world that, you know, we don't know what goes on in these models and they are not explainable, although a lot of work is happening in that space. How do we and how does ADAPT and you think about as a leader in this field and a thought leader, think about responsibility and how do you make this AI be responsible towards humanity at large? So, you know, we don't leave people behind and worse yet, don't let this technology do evil things. Yeah, I think this is this is one of the most important things for all of us to be really careful about and deeply thoughtful about over this coming period. Um, I think you know, um, back when I was open AI, at OpenAI, um, the safety and policy teams, I, I spent a lot of time supporting, um, and it's like it's an area that I've put a ton of my own personal time into. But there's a couple of different things that are important to talk about here. I think one is like, what is even the intent mm. of what, what we are trying to do? Um, I think um, in the field as a whole, um, there are uh, companies and players who sort of frame this as like, you know, our, our, our goal is to build general intelligence, which is defined as something that can do, uh, that can uh, basically replace humans at economically valuable tasks, right? Like, that's really not what we want to do at Adept. I think like that framing alone, I think sort of sets up this like very, uh, very, very, very adversarial sort of thing, right? Um, the way that I think about it is that um, is that the real opportunity we have with uh, the current developments in AI is to hand people and hand everyone, right? Something that feels much more like a teammate, mm. something that feels much more like a system that keeps you as a human in the driver's seat, right? It's not about replacing people at like economically valuable tasks. Mm. It's really at the end of the day, I almost even think about it a little bit like um, like providing like that high level interface, right? In the same way that like, um, a musician before a synthesizer, right, would have had to right. go learn how to play every single one of those instruments in order to go get the sounds they want. And now with the synthesizer, you have this one interface to everything. Yeah, I think that's the power that we have with AI right now is um, is this like thing that lets you operate at a much more abstract level um, every day as a person. Yeah, and you know, as someone who likes cars, I like to think about it as what cars used to be before power steering or ABS systems or cameras, right? Exactly. It was a lot harder to drive, but right now I still have the thrill of driving with the aid of all these teammates, if you will, yep. right, in, inside my car. Yep. Yep. Uh, and talking about building companies, uh, obviously capital is an important component of that. And in today's environment, I'm sure you had no dearth of suitors and uh, people who wanted to partner with you. Talk to us about that process. How did you think about who the right partners were? And we are obviously very thankful that you picked us a general catalyst to be your partner. Yeah, I mean, we're super, super grateful to have you guys involved. I think that's been that's already been amazing. I think there's a lot of enthusiasm in the space. Um, and I think um, we've been fortunate that that's been the case from from investors. Um, and I think especially because there are not that many companies that um, have the niche expertise expertise, I think, for foundation model training. And so I think the space has kind of gone down a path of, I think, um, 
uh, concentrating bets in a couple of foundation model companies. Um, but I think for us, you know, like as we thought about who to work with, I think the most valuable thing is actually just really optimizing for people um, and optimizing specifically like 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 deep. Like I think like like of all the people in the world, I think you're just extremely good at thinking through a lot of the strategic implications of um, what uh, what a, how it what a depth does fits in with the roadmaps for tech as a whole and um, the different uh, partners that we should be working with as we try to make a depth be successful. And I think like just like throughout the process, like um, we were trying very hard to figure out like who could be put around the table that would really up level the quality of thinking around strategy around a depth. And I think that was a giant reason why we partnered with you. Well, thank you for that. And uh, it's, you know, the journey has been short so far, but it's been very productive and fruitful yeah. uh, for me as well. So I'm, I'm glad to be partnering with such a big brain as yourself <laughs> and the rest of your founding team. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the founder journey. Like, how do you think about constructing a founding team you know, what are those conversations like? And as the company evolves, like, how, how do you think about all of that? Yeah, uh, for us, you know, um, a lot of it came out of thinking about what is the shape of opportunity that we really want to go after? And how do we make sure that our initial founding team is the uh, is able to deliver on something that's actually quite large in scope? So for us, um, because we're a foundation model company, right? We're training these models that turn natural language in, into into actions. It's a it's um it requires us to build quite a lot of, quite a lot in house. And so um, um our our friend and former uh, or current colleague as well as former colleague during that era um um used to uh, used to run giant model scaling at DeepMind. His name is Eric Elson, right? And um and so he, so he so he came in with us to basically help anchor the the core team on giant model training, right? Our teammate Fred um, used to be responsible for a lot of the training data efforts that we did for model training within Google Research, and so um, and like for the human feedback loop that we're building, um, as well as the training data loop that we're building, um, is absolutely critical to the company. So so Fred came in, Kelsey ran large model PM, etc. So we kind of needed to figure out um, a, a core group that was able to actually like figure out the full scope of what we're doing. As you look ahead. Uh what do you look for in terms of who's the right person to add to the team? Everyone's like trying to hire engineers and so on. How, how do you ensure that you have like a good good balance of all the kinds of things uh, and skill sets that you need in, in a depth so that you can actualize this really big and large vision? Yeah, you know, I think the, the thing that's maybe a little bit more unique to us and, and um, companies that are really swinging at making new AI systems work is that um, is that there's been this giant shift from the pure bottom up basic research mindset to one that's really focused about building big systems, mm. right? Like it's like like AI is no longer a cottage industry of like you and your three best friends write a research paper that changes the world. It's really like how do you do giant swings at the level of like AlphaGo, right? Or um, or like giant training runs like GPTs where we did at Google, which was Palm. And so um, so what's really top of mind for me has been can we figure out who out there really wants to get their hands dirty building something yet also knows a lot about machine learning yeah. and like wants and is like fundamentally motivated not by papers but by um but by like like building something that has brand new capabilities that actually people want to use every day yeah uh, we see a lot of companies coming through on ai and a lot of times it's like oh by the way we have ai ml uh, if someone was starting a company in this space today like what is the advice you would give them yeah, the biggest thing I would think about is like, what are your compounding advantages? Mm -hmm. Because I think right now what's really interesting is like the proliferation of large models of various kinds um, that you can build on top of as an API, I think has made it really easy for anyone to add certain AI features to existing tools. In those areas, I think it'll be it'll be harder to actually be able to stand out. And I think really thinking about like, what are the compounding advantages you're gonna have? Is it data? Is it like a particular workflow? Is it like a particular segment of customers that you can really nail and own? I think. Those are the top line. Yeah, the core, the core IP, the reason of being yeah. an AI company. Yeah, and without AI, would it work or not? And then the value loops, as we talked about. Right, and I think the other part of it too is like, um, is like it kind of like makes me think a little bit more about when every company was a mobile company right. ten years ago, right? Like. When that happens, it just kind of fades into the background. It stops being something you really think about. So if you're starting an AI company, you, you really mean it. Like, yeah. like, what is the AI part of that compounding for Correct. you? Correct. Let's uh, take the conversation in a slightly different direction and get to know you. Tell us, like, how did you get, you know, we all have our immigrant to soft, software stories. Like, uh -huh. you know, and you've told me a little bit about 
uh, going with your dad in Waltham, Mass, uh, in the evenings after school. Yeah. Uh, tell, tell us the story in your own words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so I was born in China. I grew up in this a city that no one's, most people haven't heard of. It's called Harbin. It's, it's got uh, like eight and a half million people or something like that. And yet most people in the U.S. have no idea where it is. But it's like really far north, extremely cold. And, um, and so like my dad once went on a business trip to the U S and realized that it was just a much nicer place. And so he ended up moving the whole family over in the mid nineties at this point, you know, he had ended up finding this job after doing like construction and dishwashing and all this stuff. He finally found this role where he could use some of the skills he learned in China. And so he became a computer monitor repair person. And he was at this like PC OEM that just like churned out these beige boxes all the time. And, um, and I, you know, I always really admired my dad and I thought it was just so cool that he was like working with computers all day because they were the, the like neatest things I'd ever played with. And, um, but as with all PC OEMs, things really went south when the first dot com bubble bust, the whole place went under, none of the invoices got paid. And he was thinking to himself, like, uh, what do I actually end up doing with my life now? Right? Like everyone in the first dot com bubble who were great software engineers ended up doing fine. And here, me over here did not turn out so well. And so he decided to learn how to code. So he was like far ahead of the curve. And what he started doing was he started going to uh, to Worcester State College for evening classes. And in the beginning, we just had one car. So they would, um, my, my dad would just haul me along. And first I sat outside the lecture hall and I started sitting in the lecture hall. And it was, it was Visual Basic 5.0. Um, so like, as y'all remember, like great little UI, you can click and drag and make, make, make forms very easily. And to me, this was like the neatest thing I'd ever seen. So, um, I started paying attention in class and I decided this was the thing I wanted to do. So my mom got the registrar to sign me up. And since then, um, I took like a bunch of college classes and did like most of the CS degree over that time. And my dad decided he hated coding and dropped out. So that's how I got into programming. That's that's amazing, and uh, you know, <laughs> David, as as you were relaying the story, it turns out that we were both in the Boston area at the same time. Oh yeah, you were taking college classes at age eight, and I was in graduate school at age twenty eight. Oh, so you know, we kind of like I'm a late bloomer, <laughs> I guess, right? From, from that perspective. <laughs> well, here I am learning for you, so it's it's perfect. <laughs> if you hadn't followed that path in that alternative universe, what would you have been doing? Yeah, I mean, I could see a couple of different things. Like, if we didn't move to the U.S., I would probably be doing something super random in China right now. Not really sure what, but I think yeah. if I were following my passions outside of everything that's been happening in AI, you know, um, one thing that I'm really interested in is 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 policy, um, and specifically like like what is the right role for government and all this stuff. Um, and I think it was a big part of why I spent a lot of time at OpenAI on the policy side as well. Okay. Um, I I think that public service is extremely important, and um, and I care a lot about um, care a lot about making sure that people who uh, may not be in tech but are in government have a really good and crisp understanding of exactly what's happening. So that's probably what I would do instead. Well, that's amazing. I, I think you'd be a perfect mentor for my daughter who is working as a policy fellow with the Senate Banking Committee right now. And she's a software engineer, so ah, yep. you know, there's you, you two have something in common there, which is uh, super exciting. I wish more people with your stature and expertise would go into policy because we we have a lot of folks writing policy who don't fully understand the implications thereof, mm. right? Yeah, there's some super super smart people in policy. I just feel like this is um, AI has really been a cottage industry for a while, and it's just hard to be exposed to all the nitty gritty of how these models actually work. And uh, but you kind of need to be armed with that, I think, in order to think about this most most productively. So talking about policy, like, do you think AGI happens? And if it does happen, what are the implications? Well, I think the major question is defining is is defining AGI. Okay. I think that um, it's such a such a um, such a difficult thing to fully reason about, because depending on how you frame it, there are just certain consequences that, that come for free. I think that, though, what's almost definitely going to happen is um, and this is actually something I'm really optimistic about, is that um, if we as a society think clearly about all of the next steps here, I think the most likely thing that will happen is that we will simply, for a lot of the roles that we do, spend a lot more time doing the like higher level thinking about what should be done and why, and less about, okay, how do I go click on X or Y or Z to go get my goal done? And I think what's going to end up happening is that, um, is that, and this is something that I'm actually really excited about, I actually think that like in this next era, like um, the value of a liberal arts education will actually only increase. Yeah. Right. Because like it's it's really teaching you how to think and how to come up with the goals and how to be like how to have like a differentiated viewpoint in the world. And I think it's really going to ultimately boil down to that and less about like um, the actual fundamental execution of an idea. 
Yeah. So if if you have a twelve year old at home, don't send them to a summer coding camp, but send them to a summer thinking camp. Is what you're saying? Yeah. Well, coding is great at developing thinking skills. Okay. Uh, good. But but um, nicely think, brought it together. But you know, yeah, thinking about the zoom out as a whole is probably is probably the the best thing that we can instill in yeah. people. So, you know, you worked at OpenAI in the very early days and OpenAI was formed because uh, the founders wanted to make sure that a tectonic shift in technology like AI would be openly available to everybody. Then you worked at Google, which has Google Brain, which is like some of the best people at Google working on AI technologies. Uh, And now you're doing a startup. What happens to the incumbents? What happens to this technology and how freely can we make it available versus it again being concentrated in some pockets of capitalism around the world and maybe the world at large doesn't see the benefits. You know, one really nice positive thing that I'm seeing about all of this is like as um, as AI has actually moved from a like cottage industry towards something that's much more oriented around um, being able to build systems and that like some of the domain expertise here has become more diffuse. I think a really nice side effect of that is that um, more and more people can train models. And as more and more people can train models, there's more and more availability and the models get cheaper simply due to quantization effects and all that stuff. Like I think this next year is going to be defined actually by um, widespread cheap availability um, of, of models of various different forms. And so I think that actually is a great way of making sure that many people have access to, to systems like these. Um, but I think that, um, I think that there will still be, um, a lot of challenges ahead with regards to how do we balance that with, um, which is really positive with the fact that like many use cases of AI, um, especially just general unrestrained proliferation, I think can lead to like new issues around spam, new issues around like cybersecurity, all these different areas where it's actually offense dominant um, or rather, uh, and people with access to cheap models can do a lot of harm. I think that's the thing we have to trade off. Thank you so much uh, for having this conversation. And, you know, we got to see a little bit about you, talk through your founder journey, how, you know, expansive and impactful your thinking is around AI. And, you know, I truly believe that you and the team here is going to be one of the leaders in defining uh, the next generation of AI technologies and its impact on the world because we are in the midst of a tectonic shift. This is bigger than any shift we've seen in the last 50 years in the field of technology and it's really, really impacting everyone. So I'm so glad it's in very capable hands of you and the rest of the adapt team. Thanks, Steve. And also thanks for you and the firm's support. Yeah, so I'm really excited about it. All right. Thank you. <laughs>